Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this Christmas Eve are the words of the Christmas gospel that we had read to us just a moment ago. Words from Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. The account of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, how did God enter your life? To answer that question for myself, I can tell you that on February 20th, 1965, I was baptized in my grandparents' living room with just a few family members gathered around. There, God claimed me as his very own. There, God promised me that everything that Jesus has done for the entire world, that counts for me as well. There, God entered my world. The Holy Spirit got his crack at my sinful heart, and I became his own. For some of you, it may have been when a friend or other acquaintance who cared about your soul took you by the hand and led you to find Jesus in his word. Maybe they took you to church. Maybe they shared the gospel with you themselves. But as their words or the words that you heard assured you that Jesus really does love you, that he really did die just for you, that he has taken your sins away and given you heaven, God entered your life. Sometimes, People may wonder whether God really does enter our lives and whether he really is a part of our world. Even for Christians who have known him personally for a large part of their lives, sometimes it seems as though he is so far away, so quiet, so invisible, so far from helping us, so hard to find that if he exists at all, well, he doesn't seem like he's really involved in my life, if you've ever felt like that, I know how you feel. And I want to assure you this evening that in spite of that, he is a part of your life. And if you've ever felt like that, then this evening's Christmas message is just the medicine that we need. You see, long before he entered our lives by faith, he entered our world in the events that we have just heard from Luke chapter 2. In the birth of Jesus Christ, we see how God enters your world. And when God enters your world, he does so in real time, in a real family, and as a real child. Now, we might be tempted to skip right past the opening words of Luke chapter 2 and not give them any serious attention, but they are important for us because they assure us that God entered our world in real time as a part of real human history. We know the words well. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. Luke's introduction does more than just introduce the story. This does do the, more than just give us a setting or a background. It's, it's, it's more than just some trivial information. It, it tells us that these events took place as a part of real, identifiable human history. Caesar Augustus and, and Quirinius were real men. This Roman census was a, an event from genuine human history. It was a historical occurrence. And that means that the birth that Luke describes is a historical event as well. Let's not lose sight of that fact. The Christmas story certainly can't be accused of lacking a certain entertainment value. We're, we're all familiar with it. The journey to Bethlehem, the, the failure to be able to find room in the inn, the poor couple desperately searching for some place to stay, stay because the woman is in labor. She's about to give birth for the first time. 
It's all under strange and unusual and untimely circumstances, the appearance of the angels, the, the coming of the shepherds. Okay, God did all these things in a way that's filled with human interest and emotion and drama. But more than just a good story, this is a real story. Do you see why that's important? The faith that we follow is more than a set of religious principles. It, it, it can't be reduced to uh, merely uh, moral ideas or teachings that we are supposed to follow. Th these are, are not uh, simply religious myths. But here, God is entering your world. He's becoming a genuine part of it. Here, God is taking action to save us, to save you, to save me. By becoming involved in our lives, God presented these truths for more than our study, but for our faith and for our comfort. It's, it's not a mere matter of our entertainment. He, he wants us to be certain because he did all of these things in real time. And the way in which he brought it all about, it's astounding. Sometimes when we, we look at the humility of Jesus' birth and the, the very humanness of it all, it, it seems as if God were, were kind of sneaking into our world, sort of slipping in through a back door somewhere. How often haven't we heard the contrast made between uh, the way in which a, a royal birth might generally take place or the way that royalty might generally uh, live and the poverty and anonymity with which Jesus quietly appeared. But when we see the whole picture and remember the real life events God caused in order to have Jesus born when and where he wanted, it's really quite impressive. God made the most powerful world ruler issue a decree, a, a, a census just so that this occasion could happen in the right way. Practically the entire nation of Israel had to move so that Jesus would be born in the right place at the right time. How God must care for you to go to all of that trouble. When was the last time anyone else among the world's leaders or the powerful was actually involved in helping you? When was the last time that anyone else changed the lives of an entire nation just to benefit you, to get you out of trouble. When God enters your world, he gets his fingers all, into all of it. And, and there's nothing that is too much for him to change if it would help you. What a precious truth to know that God enters your world in real time. But the Lord wants us to be assured that he is closer to us still. He doesn't just involve himself in the genuine events of human history. When God enters your world, he does so in a real human family. Luke's familiar words continue. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Genealogies in the Bible are rarely the most interesting part to read. You may have studied the long section of lists of people in the book of First Chronicles or maybe in Genesis chapters uh, 4 and 5, and you wondered how you were able or going to be able to keep your attention and get through it patiently. Verse after verse of lists of unfamiliar names of unknown people to you. That does not seem like very stimulating reading. Today, you and I can find the genealogies exciting. Both Joseph and Mary belonged to the house of David. They were both branches on the same family tree. Through Luke here and also Matthew, the in the Old Testament writers, we are able to trace Jesus' lineage back, right back to King David or right back to Abraham, all the way even to Adam, whom we read about in our first lesson tonight. 
through his mother by blood and by adoption through Joseph, as it were. Jesus was born into a real human family with a real human family tree and is a natural part of the family of all mankind. But why is that exciting? There's a a story in my family, a, a legend of sorts, that if you trace the family tree back to my mother's great grandpa, Holloway, the family has connections to British nobility. Now, I don't know if anybody has actually gone and researched the claim, but when I was growing up, it always seemed as something of a uh, privilege to think that we might have some connection with uh, blue blood, that we might have nobility or even some connection to royalty in the family, even if that relationship was a, a very distant one. One thing I know for sure is that we all have a touch of the same blood that flowed through Jesus' veins, flowing through our own. That is a privilege that every one of us, every single one of us, enjoys. He was born into a, a real human family, and his family tree and our family tree must meet somewhere in the past. God must dearly love you and me to choose to become a part of our human family tree in this way. Our sins, you know, ruined the family name. All of us have, in some sense or another, been black sheep in this family. But despite how disreputable the family of mankind has become because of our sins, Jesus loved us so much that he condescended to join us in this family anyway. In fact, it is just because of those sins that he entered the world as one of you, as one of me, in a real family. He's qualified to be our Savior because he entered your world as your brother in the faith. After saying that in Jesus, God has entered our world in a real family, perhaps the the next point seems painfully obvious, but it is also one of the greatest wonders we have to consider from the Christmas story. God entered your world as a real baby, a real child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, if you had a choice, I doubt whether you would choose to live in a world with runaway crime. You would not choose to live in a world where, where tornadoes or floods could suddenly come and take away everything you own in an instant. You would not choose to live in a world that, that has tears and, and, and pain and, and insult and hatred as a part of it. But Jesus did. And he lived here without any special advantages, despite the fact sometimes people think he, he had some. He, he was equipped to feel it and experience it all the same way that we do when he came as a real child and grew up to become a real man. Luke tells us simply that when he was born, he had to be ripped in, wrapped in strips of cloth just like all the other babies of his day. If, if it were in our day, it would have been, I suppose, pampers or huggies or uh, something like that. We see no special privileges given to him. When, when, when Mary's arms eventually grew tired from, from holding the little baby, well, then they had to put him down in the, the best kind of bed they could put together, that they could find in a makeshift way there in the stable. And it happened to be a feeding trough for animals, uh, the manger full of hay for the cows or goats or sheep that took shelter in that same place. As Jesus grew up, the pains and the inconveniences of living in a world corrupted by sin did not change for him. We might imagine that when he was a little boy, if he fell and, and he scraped his knees, it would have hurt just like it would have hurt you when you were a child or as it would hurt one of your children. He, he may have gone and run to his mother for some comfort and might have cried, she may have put a bandage on it and then given him a hug to make it feel all better. We know that when he was a man, he got tired and thirsty after a long day of traveling. He, he cried when his dear friend Lazarus passed away. It hurt him too. As a real child, and then later as a real man, God experienced life in our world as we do. And he experienced human lovelessness 
and coldness and hostility as we do as well. There was no room for him in the inn, the guest house, when the family came to Bethlehem. No one cared enough to give their place to a poor pregnant woman who was in labor and about to give birth. No one cared about the health of a poor little baby. The coldness and lovelessness that he experienced there was just a foretaste of things to come. On a hill, about five miles away from Bethlehem, about the distance from here to Lake Thunderbird, or about halfway between here and Lake Thunderbird, there was another hill, a place where they crucified the criminals in Jerusalem. When God entered your world, he experienced human sin and hostility there too. But it wasn't just the, the coldness and the hatred of the people who lived there. We first entered Jesus' life and became a part of his world when he took all of our sins upon his shoulders and then he died our very real death and experienced the real pain for every human being so that our sins could be forgiven. That's not a truth intended so much to make us pity him as it is to make us see how dearly he must love us to enter our world as a real child, a real person like this. And since he has risen from the dead, he still becomes a part of our world today and still enters our hearts by faith. God may seem so distant when life is full of stress, and perhaps that may even be magnified by all the busyness of this holiday season, by all the weirdness of the, wor of the world and the year in which we have just lived. It can tempt us to ask, where's God been? Can we really think that he knows something about our lives? But today, tonight, you can be sure that he is here for you because you can be sure that he was there for you when God entered your world. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.